I'm really excited to talk to you today about one of my absolute favorite buildings in Charleston, and that's located at 270 King Street, and it's Charleston's Masonic Temple. The picture I'm showing you, you're probably wondering where on earth is that? Well, you know, don't be surprised if you aren't familiar with this building because we haven't seen it look like this in a very long time. This is the building here uh, that I am referring to uh, as it sits today. So I wanna walk you through a little bit of the history. We were really excited to have a hard hat tour. The space in this building with 20 foot ceilings on the second floor, 20 up to 35 foot ceilings on the third floor is one of the most remarkable spaces uh, in any building in Charleston. And unfortunately, uh, we cannot be together to tour the building. But in, in lieu of that, we wanted to give you a history and run through on the building and, and very hopeful that we can continue to work with the property owners to have a hard hat tour once we can get back to uh, doing things like that. But want to give a little bit of background, and I think we've got to start by talking about what is Freemasonry or the Masonic Lodge? What is this concept? And, and basically what it is, it's a fraternal organization that traces back to the 14th century, back to the stonemasons and the guilds that were used to regulate what was happening in masonry and communications with clients and government, et cetera. And it really boomed in popularity. And so really from the 17th century up until the early 20th century, um, this was a incredibly popular uh, endeavor. And here you can see a print showing George Washington as the master of his lodge. Uh, and as I said, this peaked in the 1920s and there was incredible wealth um, that the dues would, would go to for these organizations. Um, and here you can see um, in the center, uh, Washington DC's Masonic Temple. And then the largest uh, structure built for the Masons uh, on the right in Detroit. Um, but let's come back to 270 King Street. Um, this building was constructed in 1871 to 1872, and it's situated on the southeast corner of King and Wentworth Streets and it was erected by the Fraternity of Masons. And the Grand Lodge of Ancient Freemasons of South Carolina laid the cornerstone in 1871. And there's some great excerpts from newspapers in the time period, and I'll, I'll read you a, a bit. Uh, it was an historic day for the Charleston Masons. Muller's brass band with instruments polished and shining strutted at the head of a long parade. 5,000 persons looked on as the marble slab which served as the cornerstone in the temple built on the same site in, eight, in 1840 was fixed into place. In the cavity of the cornerstone was placed a sealed jar containing old coins, papers, and a piece of stone brought from the ruins of the temple of Jerusalem by, grand, by past grandmaster Robert Morris of Kentucky. The trowel used to spread the mortar was the same one used by the Marquis de Lafayette in laying of the cornerstone of the DeKalb Monument in Camden in 1825, now owned by Friendship Lodge No. 9 of Charleston. The monumental edifice was designed by John Henry Devereux. Uh, Devereux is one of my more favorite um, Charleston architects. He's an Irish immigrant uh, whose family immigrates when he is a teenager to Charleston uh, and is essentially a Charleston-trained uh, architect. His talent was discovered at a young age um, and the South Carolina Institute offered to actually have him trained in Italy as a sculptor. Um, but his family declined the offer and he ended up studying architecture uh, in Charleston. Um, and he worked for the great Edward C. Jones. Um, his career was interrupted by the Civil War where he served as a captain of the cavalry and later as an inspector of depots for the Confederate War Department. After the war, Devereux established his own practice as an architect and builder designing uh, a lot of buildings that, that might surprise you. Um, here you can see um, uh, the actual birthplace of the Preservation Society at 20 South Battery. Um, Colonel Lathers, who was a, a, a Northern sympathizer, um, had purchased this house uh, and completely renovated the house and made it in, in much more of the modern style that was popular in New York in the time and the Second Empire style. Um, Lathers is a remarkable individual that we're continuing to learn more about but really he did this as a meeting place to help try and spur reinvestment in the South to help um, uh, address the, the crippled economy of the South. Um, but Devereux, uh, his touch is all over Charleston. Um, the post house, uh, post office and courthouse uh, is his design. 
uh, on the bottom left is a female seminary that he designed that no longer stands. One of the most interesting ones, and this is the only known photograph of it, is his mansion that he built for himself on Sullivan's Island, which uh, apparently towered over every other building on the island. And then on the right is the uh, Academy of Music, which uh, was later replaced uh, by what is today the Riviera Theater. Uh, he also had done a lot of, of churches and buildings of worship, um, including St. Matthew's Lutheran Church, which uh, you may not know this, this was the tallest building in the state of South Carolina from the 1870s to the early 1970s. He also was the architect for the incredibly historic uh, Mother Emanuel Church. Um, and so you can see an early rendering of it uh, and today in its present appearance. He was also a founder and builder of the Stella Maris Roman Catholic Church on Sullivan's Island. Um, and he was very active on the island. And I think this is one of the most spectacular buildings that a lot of people don't really know about uh, in the Low Country. And another project uh, he had done was the Brith Shalom Synagogue in 1874 that um, really was now where the Cato um, Center for the Arts is at the College of Charleston at St. Philip and Calhoun Street. Um, that building was lost, but the interior was actually salvaged and reinstalled um, at their new uh, synagogue on Rutledge Avenue, and that is now part of the BSBI uh, synagogue, Brith Shalom Beth Israel. But I think of all his projects, when we're trying to understand the Masonic Temple, um, is probably best example to look at would be his opera house that he built in Camden, South Carolina. And if you look at the interior of the picture, this is really for me what kind of conjures up what the interior of the Masonic Lodge um, very well could have looked like. What you can see the decorations. You know, the bottom line is Devereaux is, is eclectic. Uh, he's working in a lot of different styles, um, but is a very skilled architect in many, many ways. So moving back to uh, 270 King, um, as you said, this monumental edifice um, really was <clears throat> erected in 1871. And the Masons selected Devereux, uh, and it was interesting because he was not a Mason, and, and there's a lot of secrecy uh, about their rituals and what goes on in these buildings. So actually Devereux had to become initiated and become a member uh, of, of the Masons in order to actually get this contract. Um, and funny enough, he resided at 99 Wentworth Street, uh, just a, a few um, uh, distant, a small distance away. And conversely, he's buried today if you're interested in St. Lawrence Cemetery. But for this building, Devereux selects a Tudor Gothic design. And Tudor Gothic is really, you see these flattened um, sort of Gothic arched windows. Um, and it's three stories on King Street. Uh, it had three storefronts, uh, and that was part of the way that these buildings would operate that would generate the income that would help pay for the, the, the use of the remainder of the building by the Masons. The formal entrance uh, consisted of a 20 foot wide foyer uh, from which stairs ascended to the second floor containing the grand lodge room. I'll walk y'all through the sort of written descriptions of the building because it's really the best um, information that we have. Um, so on the second floor, you have the grand lodge room, which was a huge space that would seat up to a thousand people. And it was noted for its huge 40 foot height, its coved ceilings carried by elaborate cornices, and it had five gas chandeliers that lit the room, and also had windows ranged in two tiers with richly molded columns, hoods, and finials. At the east end of the great room was a projecting balcony curved with massive oak and walnut brackets with a Gothic balustrade of, as in quotes, elegant finish and design. On the third floor, uh, in the original design, there were examining rooms, not exactly sure what they're examining, but they were, they were called examining rooms. And there was also the Blue Lodge room. This room seated up to 600 people and, and boasted a dome ceiling with 40 foot high um, to the top of the ceiling. Uh, and the walls were blocked off and made to look like imitation stone, and the ceiling was corniced and enriched. And so, you know, I've always believed that given the tie to Freemasonry and, you know, that this building would have been incredibly richly decorated and really would have boasted the skills of Masons. And so it's interesting to hear 
um, accounts of faux stonework on the interior of the building seems to make a lot of sense. Um, as I said, the style of the building is Tudor Gothic, which is known for its slightly flattened Gothic arches. And it was, the facade is also enriched by these clustered columns um, that are sort of richly molded. Um, and unfortunately, much of the exterior and pretty much all of the interior uh, were, were ultimately you know, defaced during the 20th century. Uh, but it still retains a lot of its um, character. Um, the windows are obviously the most notable change. Uh, and the local lore has it that this was the first air-conditioned building in Charleston. And I'll come back to that uh, in a few moments. Um, but I think there are a few buildings in all of Charleston, right? We see Gothic come in and Gothic, you see it in a lot of outbuildings. You see little bits of Gothic all over. You know, one of my favorite is the carriage house at the Miles Bruton is a great example um, where we see these really um, mature Gothic embellishments going on buildings. But there really aren't many complete buildings, um, certainly not of this scale that are Gothic. You have the, the great, um, that also actually was worked on by Deborah, the building at the southwest corner, um, the German um, uh, Prunschaftbund Hall, uh, which is at the corner of George and Meeting Street. But I think, you know, once restored, this is going to be one of the most spectacular Gothic edifices in all of Charleston, and I think one of the finest buildings on King Street. But back to the building, interestingly, um, after the building, soon after it was completed, um, the grand spaces that I just mentioned were immediately had to be divided um, to increase rental income. Because as soon as the building was built, it became evident that there was something radically wrong with the structure itself. And basically the building was collapsing. And so in order to keep it from collapsing, the Masons would have to raise $30,000 to fix and retrofit the building. And to put that in perspective, the building only cost 35000 to build. So you can understand this was a major, major expense. Um, and so they really realized that it would be impossible um, to, to do this from the treasuries of the various chapters to raise this money. So they started looking for uh, an opportunity to partner. And along comes the Washington Light Infantry, um, who was really looking at the time for a suitable space. And they agreed to erect the wall um, which would structurally reinforce the building. And, and what it is, is the building has such a large span going up and down King Street and the joists would run along the ways. The building was not able to sort of carry the loads and the weights that were occurring in there. So interior walls had to be constructed to structurally reinforce this. So that the infantry basically erects the wall and um, for a 30 year uh, lease that is rent free, but of course to make the contract legal, the, the infantry actually paid the Masons three peppercorns a year just to keep it on the up and up. And one last little side note, you know, buildings have great mythologies and, and this building I think is unrivaled in that regard. And there was a great article I found that, that this was once held to be a place of devil worship. Um, there was a Frenchman named Leo Taxel who was, was considered to have a rather perverse sense of humor but um, about 1895, he came out with a charge that the Masons were Luciferians, that they worshiped the devil. And so this came at a time when the Roman Catholics and the Masons were not on the best of terms. And Pope Leo VIII had heard of this story and sent word to Bishop Northrop of the Charleston Diocese to sort of investigate what's going on and make sure there isn't uh, some nefarious activity. And the Bishop actually followed up with Devereux uh, and spoke with him and questioned him. And, you know, they determined that the charges were ridiculous. But, you know, Taxel had said that there was a secret room in the temple where the devil would manifest himself. And it was here that they said that the neophytes took solemn oaths and pledged their loyalty to Satan. Um, a pretty uh, long, long uh, tale, um, but no evidence. And Devereux seems to have been able to um, squash that. Um, so one, um, as we come into the 20th century, as I said, the building was immediately cut up to create more rental income. And that seems to be the trajectory of the building through its entire life. Uh, and so the Masons really occupy, and I mentioned earlier that 1920 was the height of Masonry. So we know that they put a, a, a rather large addition on the back of the building because they're simply running out of space to meet. Um, and so they appointed a committee 
and the committee was composed of William W. Wanamaker, Kenneth Baker, J. Campbell Bissell, and Thomas R. Waring, and they recommended that $70,000 be appropriated to extend the building back towards um, uh, Meeting Street along Wentworth. And the building was remodeled and the addition was, was added in 1922. And this allowed the Brotherhood, whose numbers had soared, to remain in the temple till 1946, when they sold the building to the Shaheed family, who owned the building until 2007. And during the, the, the Shaheed uh, period, the building is modernized. Um, and I said, the rumor is that it's the first air conditioned building in Charleston. And it's just my theory, but I believe that's when the windows would have been changed out. Just for reference, the windows on the second floor are 16 feet tall, and on the third floor, they are 12 feet tall. That is a tremendous amount of glass uh, and air infiltration. It would have been very difficult to air condition a building of this size with windows. So I believe that the windows would have been done in the 1950s when the air conditioning was put in uh, to help make the building more efficient. Um, and basically the upper floors had been vacant for a few decades. Um, and I have a history with this building. My former company, we purchased this to actually restore it and renovate it back as um, condominiums. Um, ultimately that was uh, ended by the recession. And so I'm thrilled that East West Partners uh, have taken this on and they will be restoring it uh, and renovating it back for residential units, which I think will be fantastic to have some lights on on Upper King Street, particularly if they are 16 and 12 feet tall, uh, as has been approved by the BAR. But as with any historic building, let's walk through a little bit of the history. These are the Sanborn fire insurance maps. If you're not familiar, they're one of the greatest resources we have to understand how the built environment in Charleston changes. And these maps exist for, for many small towns. And they were really uh, maps that were done to assess fire risk because this is pre-fire department. They're private fire companies. And so the Sanborn fire insurance company was going out and assessing risk. But you can see here on the corner of Wentworth and King, if you notice there are three bays in the building running along Wentworth and those would have been the three stores. And you can see the S on the corner, that would have been store. It looks like the middle was build and then the, the, the southernmost bay was cigars. And then it says hall and armory on the second floor and then the Masonic lodge on the third floor. So it's even telling us a little bit about how the building's being used. But if you see the entrance is coming in off of Wentworth Street and there are three sort of staircases. And so this was the great grand stair that was referenced in the article that I mentioned a moment ago. And so coming forward, we can see how much the building is constantly changing. This is a view um, uh, of an updated Sanborn map, but it doesn't show the extension on the rear. But all of a sudden you can see that the entrance is now located on King Street in the center bay and the staircase has changed. And again, it says Armory Hall on the second, Masonic Lodge on the third. Now we know that these maps can sometimes be inconsistent because they're not using these for historical reference, but for insurance purposes. But again, it shows now that, that things are even in flux with the location of the stair. And so here in 1951, this one actually captures the addition that has been added onto the back. So now, you can actually see, they don't show the, the divisions of the stores, but it says Masonic Temple Lodge Rooms on the second and third floor. So it appears, at least according to these maps, that um, post-renovation, the Masons occupied the second and the third floor, which seems to be consistent with the blow, you know, the, the absolute explosion of, of membership that they see. But the entrance has now been moved around to where you can see 73 Wentworth, uh, and, and what you can see is that little square, it says stairs, and that little square within the square is actually an elevator that remains to this day. So the whole orientation of the building changes um, with this renovation. Uh, and here you can see a little bit close up, this is the 1955, but you can see the, the bays added on to the rear of the property um, in this, and here you can see a little bit more clearly the stairs uh, and the elevator. And one of the things that's interesting is you see where it says in the middle of the building, I are posts first. Well, there are iron posts on the first floor that would have been probably part of that structural renovation um, that I mentioned earlier. Going back, looking through some of these historic photographs, always very helpful. You know, this is one of my favorite pictures of Charleston. I mean, look at King Street. It's hard to imagine. 
you know, Charleston has such a, uh, an incredible architecture, but it's fairly restrained. But you look back in this period, and by looking at the cars, this is, you know, arguably the 19 teens. Um, look how eclectic Charleston is. Um, and I love the dome building. And here you can actually see uh, its clock on the corner. This is Caddy Corner from the building that we're talking about. And you can see this is the new uh, YMCA building. Uh, clearly an incredible um, building. And even across the street, um, what was uh, an Indian restaurant for many, many years, I believe it's a blue jean store now on the corner, you can see how it had an incredible two-story entry arch um, that unfortunately has been obscured. But looking back on the right, you can actually see the sign on the front of our building. Um, well, a couple actually, you have J.S. Pinkison Cigar Company, who they seem to be present through most of the, the time um, I almost wonder whether Mr. Pinkison was a Mason himself. Um, but then there was also, um, uh, you can see the sign that says Masonic Temple below that. It's rather dark. Um, but clearly the cigar business is booming. Uh, and you can see lots of people out in the foreground. Uh, again, just love these images of, of Charleston and King Street. But the building itself, look at the windows for a second. You know, they're incredibly deep and richly adorned. Um, and we believe these would have been uh, metal windows or wood windows. It, it, there's discrepancies, it's hard to tell. Um, you know, I think probably the best theory is wood. Um, we know that the windows actually pivoted. They didn't open like regular sash. Because again, you have to imagine that these windows on the second floor, the bottom sash are about nine feet tall, um, eight feet tall. Um, so they're really incredibly large windows. But here you can see a little bit better example. And one thing I will say, if you look down at the corner storefront, it has been altered. Um, there were arches that came across but all three of these facades. But as was popular in the late 19th century, the corner building, the arch was opened up and they put in the prism glass, um, which was very popular in that period. Um, you can actually see the clock on the front of the building at this point seems to indicate that there was a bank occupying that space. Um, and so trying to understand the windows, you know, in order to get the building renovated and approved by the Board of Architectural Review, you can see here on the top left um, how those windows pivot uh, and they operated that way. Uh, and then you can see it's actually Atlantic National Bank um, and then the great Pinkison's um, cigar sign on the corner of the building. Um, but this is the building today as we know it. And so let's do a quick walk around the building. Obviously, um, a little bit, uh, a lot of bits has been lost with the changes to um, the windows. But now you can see on the facade that in the early 1980s, um, under the guidance of Chip Lawrence, um, local architect, the facade was restored on the ground floor. Uh, and so you can see those openings return to their original appearance. But here you can see it's an incredibly tall building. Um, and when we turn the corner, you can see the buttresses that run along the south side. And if we zoom in a little bit, you can actually see that there were windows uh, on all four sides of this building when it was built. Uh, some of these which will be reopened uh, during the, 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 the renovation that's upcoming. Now we're looking at the back. You can see the brickwork changes uh, quite a bit. This is the addition. And so when we come around and look at the south side, you can see how the windows continued all the way to the back of the original portion but then there are no openings in that $70,000 addition that was added on in the early 20th century. Um, one thing that's interesting is the entryway, there appears to, the, the current entryway is original, and what you can see in this photograph, which is very interesting, is as the bays go back, the very last bay, where if you can just look in there and see a rather large, almost sort of Moorish arched, Tudor arch entryway at the very end of the building, it looks as though the very last bay was only two stories, uh, and it looks like it has a roof that starts to curve back, um, slope back above it. Um, and here you can see these are the, the bays that were basically filled in and then added onto the back. Um, and when we look at that door, I think it starts to give us a little bit of a glimpse of some of the previous grandeur that this facade and building may have, have, have have had. And one of the things that's interesting is you notice next to the door that cornice piece on the left just sort of trails off into nothing. Again, 
it's probably an older doorway. The bay has been enlarged, so you see something odd. That certainly would not have been original that way. But here's a couple um, little clues, I think, about this building. Again, these, these are the masons. And so we anticipate there to be fine brickwork and stonework and great masonry. And so around this entry, you see on the right, the plinth block or the base of the door surround is actually brownstone. And then on the left, where you can see this sort of hammered and chiseled rusticated blocks that run up the door jamb, it's actually sandstone. So my belief is, is that the building would have actually had a color scheme not too dissimilar from what we see here, but it would have been light sandstone and dark brownstone, almost sort of a polychromatic uh, treatment. And so this is the entrance and you can see when they added the elevator and the stair hall, you can see the original flooring that's been basically built up uh, one step so that they could install an elevator and have access to the elevator. But this is where I think the experience and quality of the building is going to start to let you down a little bit. So as you enter the door, um, this is not what I would call an exactly a grand entry anymore. Um, this is a concrete shafted um, fire stair that takes you up the building. And when you arrive up at the top on the right, you can see, you know, would have been a large opening and, and you know, it almost sort of had a feeling of a ticket office when you came up there. And along the second floor, you had a whole series of offices. All of the ceilings had been dropped from 20 feet down to about eight. Um, actually, when we were working on it a decade and a half ago, we actually found lots of rooms that had been completely closed off and spaces um, uh, that had just been lost as the building had been renovated time and time again to accommodate many, many different uses. And I think um, there are many, many local Charleston businesses that at one point or another had occupied these spaces. So along Wentworth Street, you had these series of offices. And then off of that was a long hallway, uh, incredibly dark as it ran down um, lengthwise the building. But the one interesting room was at the northwest corner where Wentworth and King Street met. And this is where the Washington Light Infantry met. Um, this would have been one of their principal spaces. And and years ago, I'd seen an interior photograph of this room with their memorabilia and their regalia uh, in it. Um, I have, could not find that photograph for, for today. But here you can see some remnant of that historic woodwork that would have been in that. Interestingly, when I first went in the building, we could actually see that, that this is called a crack monitor. The actual facade uh, is sort of leaning out into the street. So um, the current team will be tying it back together and reinforcing it. Pretty common. Um, this would have gone through the earthquake with the changes to the storefront, really long facade, not surprising at all. Um, but this is something that, that has been present for decades um, that they will be addressing. But here you can see on the left how there's a large cased opening that's been filled in to make offices, duct work, to make them air conditioned. This whole ceiling was, was obscured. And you can see on the right where the windows were clipped off. So all of the ceilings were brought from 20 down to about eight feet. And again, that would have made a much smaller space to air condition. So you think about it, you had an air conditioned space, unair conditioned space, air conditioned space, uh, couldn't have been the most uh, efficient. And here you can see the windows and some of that detail work that I mentioned. So stepping to the south, we're looking back and you can see the room we were just in through the doorway in the background. This would have been some of the large meeting spaces flanking King Street. And if you look above, there's a large box truss, um, which I'll, here's another photograph of. Um, these would have been the, the members that helped support um, the large open spaces uh, above uh, on each level. Uh, and here on the second floor was interesting. I mean, here was a room when I first went that was added. It was built in a giant space. That's insulation that you're looking at. And it had a little window unit air conditioner. So in this building, you had outdoor space, indoor space, conditioned space, unconditioned space. Uh, it, was, um, it was unique, to say the least. And this might have been the most, I think, confusing space. Clearly, there was some production here. There was a conveyor belt on the right that actually went and fed down into the ground floor. And here you can see um, that space. And you had a, a wall that was covered in wire mesh. I'm not sure why, what they were trying to keep in or out. But behind it, you see all that large equipment. That is the original air conditioning, and some of it's not. Uh, on the right, you can actually see a cooling unit, 10-ton unit for the first floor. 
these were amazingly intact. These were all put in by carrier. They had the blue carrier badge on them. But interestingly, what's next to this on the right and the, and the image on the left with the two units, well, these are condensers. These are your outdoor air conditioning units. So as the upper floors were abandoned, they needed to air condition the, the, the store spaces down below. So they actually put the outdoor units in the building and just vented them to the outside. I've never seen that anywhere. Um, that has been corrected. But you can see on the right the water damage. Um, you can see how bad the plaster was. But to the original AC system, here's a ductwork. And this duct is probably about eight feet by about five feet. Just incredibly huge ducts that went up. And so this is in the first original air conditioning system. There was an entire room, actually two rooms that are about 20 feet by 15 or 30 by 15. And on the, on the one on the right was the intake and it would pull the air and you see the conveyor belt as a giant turbine that would pull the air into that room. And then it would be cooled and conditioned by equipment in the foreground. And then the pump on the left would actually then push it back through the building. Um, an incredible uh, early um, example of an air conditioning system. But some other changes on the second floor, the floors had been chopped. And so they had made two stories where they were one. Uh, and then moving up to the top level where we start to think, see a little bit more of the presence of the Masons. This would have been the entryway. And it clearly, I think, had served as a dance school um, and, and performing space um, for many years after the Masons left. But as you walked in, you, again, the ceilings had been dropped, offices had been cut in. There were some remnants of the fraternal use, uh, water fountains and other uh, fixtures. Uh, here, as we move up along the Wentworth Street, we can see there was actually some great woodwork detail that remained um, from those um, original period and window surrounds. Um, and this would have been the large theater that overlooked King Street. So this would have been where, again, the Masons had their meetings uh, and did their thing. And here you can see looking the other direction and they had a stage. And remarkably, I think the Masons, because they're very protective, they, I think they gut the building when they leave. They don't want to leave any evidence of what it is they're doing behind or secrets. Um, and so the, in all of the building, when we went through it um, about 15 years ago, the only thing that we found in the entire building that was from the Masons' occupation were these um, blocks that here you can, if I go back, you see there at the top corners of the stage surround. And that was it. That was all that was left, um, but pretty interesting in their own right. Um, you can see the incredible stage equipment showing you that it was clearly active um, in, in, a, in a used space. Uh, and then this is uh, another theater that was in the back of the building. And this had a ceiling height of about 35 feet. Uh, and this is looking back, you can see it had a balcony. Um, again, you can see really how poor the condition is. And what had happened is this building, like many in the period, thought they were doing something really, really clever. You have those high Gothic parapets that run around the roof, but how does the water get off? Well, buildings like this, they did internal gutters. And so here you can see as the roof comes down to the wall, there is a gutter that runs through that. And unfortunately, these gutters fail over time. And here you can actually see it completely um, failed. And so what's happened is for decades, water has been running down the inside of these buildings. You can see wet wood and the mortar is completely, has been completely washed out. And this is a little bit lower down below that. You can see the damage that moisture will do. One last little tidbit, um, right across the street when the Renaissance Hotel was being built, um, they had a tower crane, as is common uh, all over Charleston, unfortunately, these days, uh, to actually erect that hotel. And the crane fell, and it landed on this building, and it struck the back corner of the building. And so here you can see uh, one of the original roof trusses, and, and the wood trusses, I mean, they are, you know, sort of like this. I mean, they're just massive, massive trusses uh, had been knocked loose, and you can see all the water damage that had come in there. So they had put up these steel gussets to sort of hold up the back of the building. Um, so uh, this building has, has uh, had an interesting history to say the least. But I think what's really exciting is when we think about the detail that this building had originally and is gonna have again, I believe this is gonna be one of the finest buildings on all of King Street. And so my hope is we'll be able to get back in here soon with you to explore this building. It is 
as I said, a space that has to be seen to be believed. And I really want to um, show you and with a couple renderings. Um, this uh, and with the, the support and, and partnership with the Preservation Society, uh, this building has been approved uh, for renovation. And this is what the renovate, renovated structure will look like. You can see the windows fully restored, uh, all the detail being added back. Um, this is a view of Wentworth Street, and this is a view of the corner. So I hope you share my excitement in the future of this building. Uh, we're really excited to work with East West Partners on this. And stay tuned, and with any luck, we will all meet up soon and have a chance to go explore this incredible building. Thanks so much.